Hello and welcome to A Piece of String, the show that brings together comedians and scientific minds to ask, and maybe answer, the biggest of all questions ever. Last time on the show, I said that we were all always naked. That was in fact a lie. But today, since it's over 30 degrees, it's no longer as much of a lie, especially for me. I'm Matthew Shribman, a chemist and a bit of a biophysicist, and with me today are Fran Grimes, a biochemist. Hello! James Wells, an engineer. Hello, hello. And Tom Gunter, an aeronautical engineer. Hello. Three of us, and three of us only, will ask a question to which one of us secretly knows the answer, and points will be allocated on a tarot arbitrary basis by our producer, Sam Lee. The winner will get this small, slimy slither of mango that I am holding in my hand. Fran, what's your question for us today? So my question is, why does mixing drinks lead to worse hangovers? Isn't ethanol just ethanol? Is it definitely categorically worse? That's what I try and work out. In my personal experience, much, much so, yes. Much worse. I think uh, definitely with like high quality wine, when I've rarely, very rarely had some high quality wine, I've, uh, I've felt positive, better than I did actually <laughs> while I was drinking the wine the next day. Uh, so I just same. wonder if there's a load of rubbish in uh, in some drinks when you're mixing. When you yeah, tend think, to mix, you're drinking rubbish drinks, I don't know. I think like very, very high quality spirits are supposed to like minimise your hangover because they're just very, very highly distilled and there's less sort of junk in them. And if you're just drinking that, obviously you're going to have a bit of a hangover, but it's meant to be far, far better. Who here has a hangover right now? Not me. Not me. Yes. That would be me then. Oh, Tom, yeah. mate. I've never had a, had a hangover before in my life. What? Um, Explain yourself. A lot of people don't get hangovers. Yeah. Uh, I think I think it's <laughs> really high. Guy doesn't get it's hangovers. really high. Like something like thirty percent of people um, won't get a hangover even if they drink like twelve units of alcohol. I was once asked to do a, a taste test on some vodkas as part of a an after hours science trip for science teachers at the Museum for Life in Newcastle. And if you're anywhere near there, you should definitely go to the Centre for Life. Really cool science museum. Just a little plug for it there. Um, and we did this session called The Science of Alcohol and we did this taste test. And the idea was we tasted really bottom of the range vodka and a really high-end vodka. And we were asked to tell which one was which. We all picked the same thing, which is the one that was tasted really clean and really <coughs> non kind of back of the throaty. We assumed that was the higher quality one. And actually it's not. And the reason is, is that really cheap spirits, the cheapest way to make a cheap spirit is to do it chemically. So it's actually much purer ethanol because you don't have things, there isn't necessarily as much of a fermentation or an aging process. So it's a much purer chemically, if you like, and cleaner chemically product. So the taste certainly is different. So I would, I would argue that possibly the, the aftermath is also slightly less so. What is it about mixing, though? That's the thing. So if you start off, and there's always that old adage about the order in which you drink mm. beer and wine and whether there's any truth in that. Beer, beer before f- wine, then you'll be fine. Wine before beer. Make Gosh. you feel queer. That's the one. Beer before wine, then you'll be fine. Beer after wine, then you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, obviously you get you do get hangover because obviously your, your liver and everything else is trying to process all of the alcohol. And in doing so, is enable to to do lots of other things that it's meant to be doing. And supposedly, so that if you drink really, really sugary alcoholic drinks, that can have quite a profound after effect because your liver is also trying to process an enormous amount of sugar as well. I read a really um, sensationalist Sun article. Um, Does alcohol <laughs> give you cancer? Not, not as, not just in my free time. I was trying to work out some interesting things for right. this. Um, yeah, alcohol gives cancer, mate. No, alcohol does alcohol not does drinking actually... alcohol also give you cancer. Um, and then I'm... according to the sun, maybe. Probably. I mean, they're just. A bit, but the thing is, there are alcohols that obviously contain, um, like like red wine has antioxidants in it, which can help to fight carcinogenic elements. But also, um, alcohol blocks the absorption of folates, which is like a, a vitamin B, uh, which I helps to regulate it. cell division. And that's why drinking lots of alcohol is is, is linked to being more likely to get cancer. But anyway, what was I talking about? Article in the Sun. The article in the Sun, yeah. Um, so uh, this, the Sun was just claiming that um, they said that if you drink alcohol and then have energy drinks, then it is the same as taking cocaine. Now, I looked into the into the kind of back end of this, and what they really mean is that 
it has a similar but much, much reduced equivalent, um, <laughs> equivalent kind of qualitative feeling that people might describe rather than necessarily mechanistic, as far as I could tell. Didn't want to read too much. Didn't want to spend too much time on the Sun article. Mm. Um, anyway. Through experience, I think that this might be true. Or it's what everyone tells me when I'm suffering. But I'd really like to know if someone has some science to me. Matthew? I have an answer. Yes. Ooh, baby. <laughs> Which is why I was uh, browsing the old Sun article. Um, uh, so, mixing drinks does not lead to worse hangovers. <gasps> there is no evidence for that. At all. There you go. Um, so the things that uh, might uh, lead to worse hangovers are some of the, uh, what you might call impurities, but I mean, they're in like intrinsic parts of the drink. They give it its flavor and stuff. Um, so during the fermentation process, you can get like acetone and acetylaldehyde and fusel oil um, and tannins. Um, tannins are the things that often give it its color and they they generally come from like aging something like whiskey in a in a barrel um and those things might give you worse hangovers because your body then has to process those things uh, tannins are generally considered to be like anti-nutritious um in the or, or at least that's that's what we used to think <laughs> is that like because they make you sick yeah, if you do a sick because you're hungover, it's the tannins, it's anti-nutrition. <laughs> I'm free! <laughs> um, but anyway, now, now we know that some tannins are actually completely fine. So there are like some tannins in like pomegranates and strawberries and those are pretty delish. But, uh, but yeah, in, ge in general, like your body processing the tannins is, is something that, that can make you feel bad if they're, if they're some of the bad ones. Um, also, I found out something quite interesting about tannins. Um, if you're worried that your water supply has been contaminated with LSD by the government or otherwise, um, uh, then you can drop some tannins in it and it might, uh, depending if you get the tannin right, uh, turn the LSD into a solid, which you can then filter out. Ideal, right? Tannin taps. Get them now while yeah, they're need, hot. Yeah, tannin tap right next to your others. So like tannin for LSD. <laughs> so like a Brita filter, <laughs> but this one removes LSD from your water. Oh, yes. I, I mean, this is a very niche thing that I just figured out just from like a bit of chemistry that I learned at university and I just like shoved it all together. Not that great a fact. Anyway, um, so yeah, the, the, so it's the impurities in the drinks. Um, and so it's not about mixing drinks, but it's about the fact that yes, you might have had a broader spectrum of drinks and therefore you might get a broader spectrum of things that your body then, then has to deal with. Um, things like bourbon, for example, and whiskey in particular um, are more likely to give you hangovers than say just pure um ethanol but actually those <laughs> well a pure ethanol <laughs> very small <laughs> amount of it um ethanol and water for me please <laughs> um, <laughs> but actually yes mixed to taste um, <laughs> shaken but, but actually the yeah the main um predictor of whether you'll get a hangover or not is is just the amount of ethanol that you consume and how quickly you consume it um, and through which funnel you consume it. Mm. And the other thing is, oh, water. So obviously, yeah, you have to stay hydrated because staying hydrated reduces the um, negative effects of a hangover. Um, and I remember when I was when I was a teenager, just just drinking a bit of alcohol um, in the early days, uh, I always had this tradition where at the end of a party, I would get a big saucepan out of one of the cupboards, fill it with water, drink mm. the whole thing and then go home. And so. I've kind of continued this to this day, but without a saucepan now, mm. I just use like a glass, a glass. Or, or a cup or yeah. Sounds like growth. Mm. So I've had this conversation with a couple of women, but I, I forget a really bad hangover. It's like really bad. Like I'll be sick all day. Oh. Like, like cat sick. It's like bleh. And this other girl I met had the same thing. And then we, she was like, we've both tried to figure it out. Like, cause it's not, it's hit and miss. Sometimes I can be blotto pissed and be fine the next day. Or I've had like five pints and we'll be sick and can, we can never narrow down when it is. But one thing that does seem to affect it is where you are in your menstrual cycle. And if you are having a period, you get a worse hangover. It's like a, just a thing that like we had noticed. And then we spoke to some other people and they were like, yeah, that's a thing. I wonder if it's about hydration and like loss of blood and things. Oh. Uh, is that why you don't get hangovers, man? What you mean? Because I'm always in the good part of my period. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just stay in that sweet spot. That's that. Okay, I've got a question. What is the best place to be 
in a plane to survive a plane crash. On top of it. A top. A stride. You know, like uh, wing walkers. I don't know if that's what they're called, though I've just really weirdly branded that. No, you know, what... the acrobats who walk from wing to wing. So is that a thing? They, they can't do that while the plane is... Move. Moving, yeah. Oh, uh, but the, not a jet, not a jet airplane. I was wondering this, like how fast does a plane go before you would get thrown off the wing if you were trying to hold on? Well, they don't hold on, they're, they're, stra- they're like strapped in. There's this huge like brace thing and it's only ever like, I don't think they do it on jets. I've only ever seen it on like propeller planes, a little bit slower. Yeah. I think that you would, if it's too fast, you wouldn't be able to breathe, would you? But it cannot be the best place to be in a plane crash. I love yeah, rumbling jet. Stand, stand- like cat. Speaking of cats, did you hear about that cat um, uh, that was discovered clinging to a microlite several thousand feet up in the air? No. And the pilot was like, hang on a minute, that's a cat on my wing. <laughs> That's had to fly down as quickly as possible so that the cat could climb off. The cat survived and uh, grew up, uh, married, um, had kids. Kids uh, went to university, um, lots of friends around. Um, I mean, I don't... Um, remember what the question was <laughs> oh, what we it, was about, about? it was about plane crashes yeah where's the I best actually, place to be yeah I heard a fact about this I'm not sure if the person oh, yeah, has an answer this. can uh, <laughs> sorry tight yep. Matthew is naked and hot and it's clearly going to his head um, I once heard that airplane seats so not necessarily where you are in the plane but that you should be facing backwards to survive a crash but you survive better if you're facing the back of the plane I heard this and that the reason that commercial airlines have their seats facing forward, whereas military planes have them facing backwards because it's safer, is that the thought of possible crash in the consumer's mind dissuades too many people from flying. So if you went into a plane and you face backwards, it means that the customer is thinking about why am I facing backwards because it's safer if I crash and therefore you think that it's more likely that you're going to crash and that's why they don't do it. I don't care about thinking if it's more likely I'm going to crash. I want to face backwards. Uh, take I mean, that I, up with yeah. American mm. Airlines or whoever you want. Or just turn your seat around. It would be just great, with it? Pair it with a spanner. Be like, excuse me, sir, um, could you return to your seat? The fasten seatbelt sign is, uh, is on. And the <laughs> do, not turn your, do not unscrew your seat and turn it around sign is on as well. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, trying to get the little flappy down tray? I mean, there wouldn't be one, right? You'd just be facing another person. You could just like, use their lap, though. Awkwardly. <laughs> just you. <laughs> so, so you'd just be like, right. How are we going to do this then? <laughs> <laughs> you would be there on flat in flight entertainment. <laughs> They'd be like the... pressing you, like trying to change the channel. I don't want this one. <laughs> I really don't want this channel. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody has survived falling from 35,000 feet in an aircraft. Is that Joan Murray? <laughs> Joan Murray? The woman who fell into a fire ant's nest. Oh, really? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know where she fell. It might be oh, She was in the back of an aircraft, I think. And I think that is meant to be one of the best places to be, apparently, right at the back. She was at the back of an aircraft. It broke apart and she went all the way down in the back of the aircraft and survived, I think. Um, she was oh, she was in the plane? She was in the plane, oh, yeah. wow. And she was in the back, back part of the aircraft. I might be wrong, somebody, if I've, if I've made a mistake there, but I'm pretty sure that she was in the back and she survived. Uh, what was I thinking? Oh, no, I've just forgot. Somebody landing in a oh, fire yeah. ant's nest. Oh, yeah, Joan Murray. Oh, right. she, I don't know if she had free fall from, like, cruising altitude. I think it was more just that she had some kind of parachute malfunction. Mm-hmm. Um, and But she hit the fire ant's nest, broke a lot of bones, and possibly would have died. But the stinging, um, uh, really so much adrenaline in her body that, that it gave time for the paramedics to get to her. Um, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, no, I was thinking about um, packing a parachute. Has anyone ever packed a parachute on when they've gone? Because that's something you always think about. You're like, oh, should have packed a parachute. <laughs> and then you land and you're like, oh, it's for the best that I didn't pack that. Yeah. If you only get one carry-on bag as well, it's like I can have clothes for my entire stay somewhere. Or I can stay alive and be nude. But why not? Why or? Why not and? Why not fashion yourself a marvellous dress from the fabric of the parachute? What about the return journey, though? Take two, no, half of the parachute. Oh, point. yeah, no, it's a good point. It it's work, a good point. It doesn't work. Yeah, no, sorry, guys. It doesn't work. Apology accepted, James. But thanks, thanks for owning up. Anyone get a little answer to this? Yeah, I got a little answer to this. Um, <clears throat> so, actually, it's, it's, it's kind of surprising. I looked at a little study that they'd done from 93 to 2000, so seven years, and 90% of people that had been in a plane crash survived. 
which is quite high, right? That's really high. No, but that must yeah. like, so any any sort of kind of collision yeah. it might be quite like minor, like something happens when they land and something like that. Yeah, but I mean, it's still they, high, they did though. classify it as a crash, so I oh, presume it's like uh, not just emergency landings, all that sort of stuff, yeah. but like. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that's actually quite good. That gave me a positive vibe. I was yeah. like, even if it does happen, 90%, that's pretty yeah. good. So, uh, yeah, Tom, you mentioned that um, being further towards the back was good. And that is mm. true. Yeah. Um, they did a test crash. I mean, I don't know how many test crashes you can do, really, because that's quite expensive. But um, all of first class would have died <laughs> straight away. And you had an 80% chance of survival if you weren't in first class. Which is bizarre. Oh, this is the one with the remote control. Wow. They put. They basically made a remote control commercial airliner. Correct. Absolutely amazing, and then crash in the desert. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly right. Mexico, I think it was. But they all the dummies like had bones in them, wow. so you, you could actually like grade how injured they were, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you want to be near an exit, really. Most people die from smoke and fire, so it's not the crash itself that kills most people. It's, mm. it's breathing in the stuff. And they make uh, recommendations. You know, get a hanky or something and make it wet if you can. Um, and they actually say that you should uh, urinate on it uh, if uh, you have nothing else to hand. So uh, use your fright and scared mm. bodily uh, reactions, I guess, to uh, cover your face in piss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that helps with the smoke inhalation. There's a, another weird thing, actually, that happens to a lot of people, which is just pure shock. They call it negative panic, uh, which is just you go into this trance-like state of what the hell has just happened, and you don't escape. Really, you've got to escape in the first two minutes, they say. But um, How has that like, evolved? It's just so bizarre, isn't it? I don't really know. Like paralyzing fear. Like you just don't move. Yeah. It could be a thing. Maybe you've broken a bone or something. It could be good to stay still. Maybe that's an idea. I don't know. Or maybe it's, weird, it's kind of it? group sacrifice for the group. So that if some, yeah. but if some of the weaker members, the same as kind of like um, in insect colonies, if a few members stop and become easy targets for whatever's chasing or is causing the threat, then the group and the majority can escape. Yeah, but evolutionarily, how do those people then pass on their genes? Well, they maybe, don't. They're maybe, just yeah. weak. Maybe they're the poor genes. Are maybe. they even people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so that, that's mainly it. The, the other sort of mildly amusing thing was that the brace position that Wait, they... other mildly amusing Yeah, I was, I, was trying to, I was trying to refer back to the last amusing thing you said about people dying in aircraft. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't... <laughs> Think about Do you not it. find that funny? Well, we'll hear you out, James. What's the other mildly amusing thing? <laughs> One of the things that people always say is that you can't, is that they always talk about crashes on water and how there haven't actually been any successful crashes on water, but that isn't true, right? Because there have been like airplane landing on the River Hudson and stuff. Yeah. That was an extraordinary bit of flying there because the fact that he didn't, the aircraft just came to a gradual halt and then just floated there is absolutely unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. Could you do it? Yeah, of course, props. Of course. yeah, done it a couple of times. Yeah. Context is Tom can't fly a plane. So when I when I was actually up and uh, one time they have to test you to test that if everything goes entirely wrong, you'd be able to be calm and you'd be able to do what you're meant to do. And they don't really tell you it's coming. So um, I was just up and flying and I'd taken off and I was going through everything and trying to climb. And then the instructor I was with just turned the engine off and took the keys out and then just sat there. And then you have to be like, okay, I need to be calm. And then you need to like choose a field. How do you choose a field? You, yeah, so you just like, I like the shade of that Yeah, no, one. you have, basically have to choose a sensible one. Because from there. Those cars yeah. look friendly. Yeah, you have to choose one because ultimately sometimes people just make quite bad decisions. And if you land in one and it's got too much grass or it's too soft or if there's cows in it, too, you much, cow, grass. too much like really, really, you know, oh, yeah, long grass, like, really, really long grass like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have packed. to basically make a sensible choice long enough, no animals, reasonably sensible sort of choice so you have to do that you have to say i'm going to go for that one over there mm. and then that's sort of set up to land for it and just before you're about to hit the deck the engine goes back on and you and seems you like you wouldn't need the engine at that point no no as in or is that do you need it to control it i guess to... if the engine goes off you just basically have to glide down and it's not you, you know a not a particularly good glider but yeah so i'm just imagining if you did crash it and it was suddenly an eruption of a uh, ball of flame and stuff and there were cows around there yeah there could be the Beautiful serendipity of, of, of steak for everyone who survives. <laughs> a bit of just get out and have some braised, lightly braised cow. A little bit petrol Flying mm. over Japan, Kobe beef. <laughs> you go. But obviously, um, let's, all, let's all eat less beef, eh, guys? And now for the mystery midsection. 
Just before we started the show, I gave everyone the following question. Trees grow three times faster by rivers with salmon in. Why? And then I asked everyone to write down a fictional but reasonable sounding answer. I'll now read out all of those answers and with the real answer mixed in. Everyone will get the chance to decide which answer they think is right. So, what have we got here? The first answer is salmon rapidly secrete nitrogen containing compounds, which bacteria in the water fix, converting them into nitrates, which plants absorb to form their vital structural protein cellulose. Number two. Salmon are famously proud of their birthplace, not unlike the loudest football fans. They actually provide a great source of moral support for the trees through football style chants. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> As freshwater fish, salmon produce urine with a high concentration of salt and other minerals which promote tree growth. The salmon jump out of the water and tend to the trees, singing joyous songs, etc., to encourage their growth. Bit of a theme there. Bears and other such meat eaters leave carcasses on the bank, promoting fungal growth, which enhances the tree growth. Right, what do we think? <laughs> well, I was really enjoying the first answer. But then it said that cellulose was a structural protein, which it's not. Um, it's a sugar. So that's what I think to that one. I'm going to go for moral support through football chanting because I want that to be true so much. Which uh, football team do you think uh, the salmon support? Do you know me? I would say if I, had a, <laughs> if I had to put any, if I think about volume of fans... Chelsea. Chelsea, nice. <laughs> nice. Um, the only one I've got, really. Can I... I'm going to go with the carnivores on the banks, fungal growth -y. Carnivores on the banks for Fran. Uh, Matthew, what are you thinking over there, mate? Carnivores on the banks, please, James. Carnivores on the banks for Matthew. I love fungi in the soil where they belong. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Bloody hell. I mean, yeah, you're both right, Matthew and Fran. Tom, unfortunately, you are not correct. Did Tom give an answer? I did get an answer, oh, yeah. I wasn't focusing I on went that. For, <laughs> I went for the moral support through football chanting. Oh, Which means that I'm no, the double winner, because that was my answer, nice. and I got it right. <laughs> well yes. done, Fran. <laughs> nice. Good work. Wait, who oh, moral support? Was so <laughs> <laughs> I also liked tending to the trees. Was that you, James? That was me tending mm. to the trees. It was very nice. James, what's your question for us today? Why do languages write in different directions? You know how some sort of go up and down and left and right and all that. All sort of over stuff. the shop, yeah. Wow. Some go into the page. Um, anyway, <laughs> why? <laughs> 3D. <laughs> um, A Braille does, doesn't was, it? Yeah. Uh, well, you guys. <laughs> um, loading bars um, in uh, Arab nations load from right to left. Like the, the wheel of death, is that what we're talking about? That kind of like buffering or... No, you did oh, no, buffer and... Like, no, the... about a loading bar, just like, you know, when it's when the bar is going across the screen, it's being like 80% complete. Oh, yeah. 92 yeah. But do they buffer anti-clockwise? <laughs> so this, so this great cartoon about um, if, uh, if Satnav uh, had a similar kind of similar accuracy of prediction uh, as the basic like Windows... 95 and Windows 97, like file operating systems, you know how they kept saying, your file transfer will take three hours, two seconds, five days. <laughs> <laughs> You're really good if you were on a journey, kept changing your predictive time, wouldn't it? And well, I by good, that. I mean bad. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if, you? Know, this reminds me of, you know, uh, records with hidden messages if you play them backwards. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we play that backwards, what do we hear? So what languages what languages are backwards? Like read as in well, it won't be backwards for them, it'll be the right way around, but read from right to left. So lots of Semitic languages. 
mm. and languages. So, for example, Arabic or Hebrew or um, uh, Aramaic languages. So, you, obviously, in, most people in this country that are writing Japanese. from left to right are right-handed. So, when you're writing, you know, and it's you know what you've written, you can see. And people who are left-handed say that's quite a challenge often because you're writing a bit. So, presumably, if the same number of pr- proportion of people were right-handed in these countries then they are writing from right to left being right-handed and therefore it's intrinsically more difficult i don't know so that that's really interesting because the majority of the world in fact are right-handed but i'm i'm so curious like what's the evolutionary advantage of that why is that so pervasively dominant across all humans don't know the answer. Does anyone else know the answer? I know, I know it's something to do with the hemispherical arrangement of the brain and that your brain puts different tasks in uh, in different halves of your brain sometimes. Mm-hmm. So, for example, like part of my research was about um, robins finding their way by seeing the magnetic field. Where we say seeing, we don't actually know if that's how they think about it. But, um, but yeah, like if you uh, give them a, an eye patch over their right eye, then they can't detect the magnetic field anymore because that part of their brain is the, it's the left part of their brain that that detects that and that's linked to their right eye. So so perhaps there's something going on in your left brain which is more more dominant with motor skills mm. um, for most people and so therefore they're right-handed. But I don't know the answer. Chinese is written backwards, right? I actually don't know. I Does don't it get up and down? Early sometimes. forms of languages, like things like hieroglyphs are mostly up and down or sometimes there are a few characters long and then, but there's quite a lot of new lining. They press the enter key a lot. Back they, in ancient Egypt. Return happy. Are they all the same width? Because I swear I've seen people reading, I mean, this is obviously right or wrong, but I thought I've seen yeah, yeah, Chinese yeah. going down on a newspaper. You can do them in both. Oh, yeah. Just checked it out. So it's not right or wrong. It's both. <laughs> it's both. Yeah. Are you any good at languages, like other languages? Sí, claro. Yo hablo español muy bien. Fran, you're saying yes. A very long way of saying yes, though. I am absolutely horrible at languages. Honest, I find it, it's almost like I can feel the mental pain of trying to learn a language. And I loved learning stuff at school, but I just lang- I just find languages so hard. When in doubt, I just go slow and loud. You yeah, shout that at people. Always, yeah. that I've seen that works, that works yeah. really well. No, that's good. Hello, ma. And if you break the syllables up so it doesn't sound like words anymore, that's even more I helpful. I think a bit of extra yeah. aggression is usually... Mm. Mm. Usually lends itself. Do to that. you know where uh, the shops are? <laughs> Did you just put two syllables yeah. into where are? Where? Yeah, it makes it clearer for the listener, <laughs> okay. Matthew. Okay, right. Has anyone got an answer for this? <laughs> I have got an answer actually. So I looked and it, in my initial research, I tried to just find the Grand Mac Daddy of languages. Like, what was the the OG language um, that was first written down? It's this thing called cuneiform, um, and it was Sumerian. The, it's Sumerian. And the thought is that that was, or the earliest examples of this were written up to down, just like we were talking about Chinese being able to be written that way. And then they think that around in the third millennium BC, there was a rotation to left to right, so a 90 degree rotation. And they think that that's probably due to tool development. So they, it was done by hammering metal, uh, sorry, not metal, wooden wedges into soft clay and then it drying in the sun. And they changed the wedge that they were using and to write left to right was much faster because of this tool. Um, is it a papyrus? It's like a chopped papyrus, isn't it? The wedge? Yeah. Oh, the tool? Yeah. Ah, so it's literally so you just slice right on... the reed and it is just that oh, shape. yeah, that is and true. you press it into the clay. Oh, okay. yeah. That's why they did it, I think. I think yeah, no, that is true. So if you if you looked at a cross section, it has a like a really narrow or long, tall isosceles mm. triangle. So the direction of the wedge and the way that it's placed in the clay, so cool. that's where you get the meaning from. So that was... First up to down and then left to right. But then as we've talked about, there are obviously, there are a huge range of languages, particularly from kind of the Middle East and Asia that read the other direction. That read, let me get this the right way around, right to left, yes. And so I was trying to find out why this happened. And there are, there are three main theories about this. So the first is that in those regions where they currently, or they still are using a right to left script, which is also called sinistraverse. Sinistraverse from the Latin sinister meaning left. So left handed, I think. Mm. Left script. They made their first recordings on stone tablets, and you would do that with a chisel and a hammer. Traditionally, right handed people would hold the chisel with their left hand and hammer with their right. So by working from right to left, they could see what they were writing as they were going. That's one theory. And then in the country, so in Europe, 
there was a, a much sooner move to kind of written on paper where you'd be using an ink, in which case if you're right-handed, writing right to left, you would be smudging and left to right is the much more fluid way to do that. So that's one working theory. Another theory is that there was this language um, that's been found in ancient Greek and Latin religious writings, and it's called, this is another difficult word for me to pronounce, especially if you factor in the, the Geordie handicap, but baustrophedon, baustrophedon, we'll, we'll write it somewhere on the podcast or someone can say it properly for me later, um, which translates to as the ox plows. And this text used to go left to right, and the next line would continue right to left. So it would be a continuous like a flow. Game of snake. Exactly like a game of snake. And the characters would mirror. So you'd actually write almost in mirror in the reverse direction. And then one theory is that that was then kind of taken and used and that some people just use the, the right to left and some went left to right. So that from that kind of like ambidextrous way of writing, if you like, different countries took on different directions and it's just kind of stuck. Did, would you have to finish every page if, you, if it was on pages like going the right way? It would be kind of weird to end at the bottom and you want to go onto the page to your left but then you'd be finishing so you'd have to go towards yeah. you want to be going towards that page you mean yeah do you like always yeah. have to start start at the left finish on the right oh, or something like, I don't know oh, really uh, maybe maybe they were better draftsmen then though you know the way that kind of old fashioned sign writers are really excellent at kind of shaping this out before they start like stone's a bit of more of a it's more difficult to, you can't just scrumple up a piece of stone and throw it away so they probably thought a little bit more about what they were writing down before they started would be my yeah Makes would be my suggestion. Um, and then the third theory is just preservation, so that by chance, different cultures and different peoples wrote in one particular way. There's no real scene advantage to writing in either direction other than smudging, and therefore things have just stayed the way they are. From an up-down, you could have gone, it's a kind of an easy deviation to take that to a horizontal script. I like so, it when things stay the same. Have you ever seen that graph of... Australians who like things to stay the same and it's a bar chart and it shows you what percentage of Australians like things to stay the same every year, year after year for several decades <laughs> in a row. No. So this, it just stays the same. Just stays the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there isn't really a definitive answer about why different languages read in different directions. There are some working theories, but ultimately it doesn't really matter. And we have arrived at the end. Points have been allocated by our producer, Sam Lee, according to a system that none of us understands. Sam, what's the verdict? Four. Well, it hasn't half been a scorcher down here in London. Um, and I don't just mean the, um, the scintillating science chat. Uh, I also mean the recent heat wave. Um, and as such, scores have been awarded this week by the amount of H2O that each of you has in your garments. Um, that's led to a four-way tie. So congratulations. Aww, thanks, Sam. Well done. Thank you very much. Wait, but I'm not wearing any garments. <laughs> the room has become your garment. <laughs> Just the coverage of sweat. Is your garment always the nearest thing that's around you? Like when you're naked, does the room or the duvet or the sheet or the towel become your garment? Or are you... Yeah. Whoa. The world. The world is your garment. <laughs> For now, thanks to Fran Grimes. Thanks. James Wells. Uh, thank you very much. And Tom Gunter. Thank you very much. Matthew Shrubman. That's me. Our producer, Sam Lee. And to Unbound for their generosity in hosting and supporting us. You can follow us on social media by searching A Piece of String or String Podcast. And if you'd like to learn about many and various scientific curiosities from a man in a bath or otherwise located, you can follow me on social media by searching Science in the Bath or Matthew Shrubman. If you have a quirky question of your own that you'd like a scientific answer for, then please reach out to us on any of our social media channels. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review us. It really helps. And we'll be back again in a fortnight. And as usual, let's never speak of any of this ever again. <laughs>